Good evening, I'm Maria Shriver, and I want to welcome all of you here uh, for this evening with Judah and Chelsea to talk about their wonderful new book, which we have put up here, I Will Follow Jesus. And uh, I know all of you are friends, actually, of Judah and Chelsea, so you, they don't need an introduction to you. But I would just want to introduce myself and uh, tell you why I'm here. Mm -hmm. um, as I said, I'm Maria Shriver, and I met Judah and Chelsea through my son Patrick. And I have seen firsthand uh, the incredible influence that they have been on my son, and then hence we have reaped the benefits of that in our family. So, uh, and I have also had the opportunity on a few times to come and listen to Judah speak. And so when I heard about this book and uh, he asked me to host this evening here, I was thrilled because I believe really strongly in uh, the message of both of these young people. I believe in their ministry and uh, the mission that they have, which is to change people's lives and open their hearts, change their minds, and empower them, which is uh, the same mission that I have. And I think obviously all of you who follow them have that same wish. Let me just back up because I'm giving you. Uh, this is uh, our office here. We call it the open field where you're sitting. It was named really after a, a poem from the mystic Rumi, who is a great uh, inspiration to me. And he wrote about the field. And there's a saying in a, a, he has that says, out beyond right doing and wrong doing, there's a field. I'll meet you there. And that spoke to me uh, when I read it many years ago. And I kind of crafted this space to be, quote, an open field. And I altered that with saying, out beyond right doing and wrong doing, out beyond shame, fear, expectation, and grief, there's an open field. I'll meet you there. So this is our open field. And we welcome you all here tonight to learn about how we can follow Jesus with Judah and Chelsea. So uh, <laughs> welcome again, and thank you. And. And even though they're giving you the book tonight, it's on Amazon, and you have to tell your friends to buy it. <laughs> okay, let's be honest. Let's get right down to it. You want to sell this book, and you want it to be a phenomenon. Um, so I was reading the book today, and in the beginning, uh, they write, look, at, we approach this book not as pastors, but as parents. And so I thought that would be a good place to start. What is the difference in your mind? Um, yeah, I'll start. First of all, for those of you who don't know, we have three kids. Our oldest, Zion, is 11, and our son, Elliot, is nine. And then Grace, our baby girl, is six. She's about to turn seven. And, you know, there's something that happens the first time you have your kids. If you're a parent, you know this feeling. We have some friends who are about to have kids, and you know this feeling. I'll never forget the first time I looked at Zion, and he was in his crib, and he was asleep. And I'm sitting there watching him, and my felt like my heart was going to burst open. There was just so much love, and I just couldn't even believe how much love I had for this child. And so I'd say we, I'd say when we approach this project as parents, thinking about that overwhelming love we have for our children, that there is a parent out there for most children who have that kind of love for their children, and we think the greatest gift we can give our kids is for them to encounter Jesus. And so our hope was that kids all over the world would encounter him in that way by the billions. Um, <laughs> but you're in the, in the book, it's very specific, kind of, you, you're parents, but it's, you're pastoring right through this book. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I mean, it's, it's a selfish move on our part because at about 8.30 or 9 o'clock when we put our kids to bed and they ask dad for a story, sometimes I can't come up with anything. So I figured if we just rewrote Stop. the Bible, I would have material <laughs> for a long, long time. Oh, you want a story in about two and a half minutes? I'll give you a good one. Um, but I, honestly, thank you for having us. Can I say yeah. that? Thank yeah. you so much. And I am um, look up to you so much, and you're a true hero. Just your passion for helping people. And your kids speak volumes to me about the amazing parenting that you have done. And we're new at this. I mean, with an 11-year-old at the oldest, we've got a long runway ahead of us. And this was an investment. Yes, at you least do. Our own kids. <laughs> yeah. With a lot of twists and turns. <laughs> but let's not talk about that. Let's talk about the book. <laughs> let's follow Jesus right now. <laughs> no, but uh, you say also in the beginning, you know that parents are really stressed out. They have a lot to do. And why should they add one more thing? Why should they start reading the Bible to their kids? 
Well, I think for me, a defining moment, my, my mom is here, my dad's passed away, but those bedtime moments were, were huge in my development. And I, I found myself remembering a Bible answer man times with dad and stories with mom. And we could ask anything and we could talk and process. And um, now the roles are reversed. I'm the dad and I'm like, okay, Bible answer man. I'm like, you know what? Ask your mom. I don't know that one. <laughs> But I can't remember the Old Testament, but um, realizing now that as a 37-year-old man processing with my kids, actually, actually, the sneaky part is that I benefit too in those moments of decompressing and, and kind of sharing a moment. And, and kids ask questions where you go, it's kind of a good point. Maybe I should know the answer to that. Or you read, you're reading this and you're like, wow, I kind of forgot that story was in the Bible. And the kids are like, dad, that's good. Tell us more. And you're like, okay, I kind of forgot that one. So I think now as a dad, those bedtime moments, which is kind of how we architected the book with the idea that, you know, at the very least fostering the idea that an uncle and aunt or a, a, a grandmother could, could read this with their, with their grandkids. And I think the grandmother will be just as inspired and encouraged as she reads these ancient stories to her grandkids and goes, wow, this is good for me too. And that's been my experience. But what kind of, what difference do you think it makes in the life of a child, in your own life, to be read the Bible, to be um, raised in a faith? Because there are so many different faiths. But what impact do you think it has on children, on family life, to have a shared faith? Yeah, I know as a mom, you spend so much time taking care of your children's bodies, just feeding them, clothing them, making sure they don't run out into the street and get ran over. It feels overwhelming. And I know sometimes you don't think about what about their spirit, the core of who they really are that makes them an individual human being. And what I think spirituality and particularly Jesus so impacts our kids with is that we believe that our children were created in the image of God for a purpose. And what that gives them such a solid foundation for is identity that I am who I am, not by accident, even if it was my parents' accident, but that I am who I am because of who God made me to be, and that that gives such a solid foundation for any human being to walk out the rest of their life knowing that they are made on purpose for purpose by a loving God. Yeah, and I, I dream. I mean, I dream of, of the country that I live in. I dream of children by the millions being told these ancient stories. <clears throat> and learning about purpose and identity and meaning and creation. And um, I just i am a firm believer that as we raise up the next generation, um, our country can change and maybe even our world. Maybe the most important part of the day in America is bedtime. Mm -hmm. And um, where little brains are being shaped with values and ideas that will help them be productive citizens and maybe dreamers themselves to, to bring about change. We, call, we usually do these um, conversations and we call them architects of change and we identify individuals as architects of change who are what we call conscious idealists, people who see things as they are but imagine what they can be and then they make it happen. And I, I'm curious as to what you, you talked about thinking we can live in a better country. What do you see and what do you imagine we can be? Um. In the words of Jesus, I didn't come to be served, but I came to serve and give my life. Um, I imagine life like that. I imagine myself being more that man with my wife, with my children, with my friends in the community that I live in. What if we woke up with an intention to live beyond ourselves and serve one another? I mean, you can just, you can stop right there and just fantasize and dream and go, I mean, so much would change. So much of the systemic pain and problem and issues that we're facing and doing our best to counter, I think, gets back to the willingness to say, look, I, I want to serve. And of course, for me and my faith, what compels me to serve is not just nobility or discipline or because I think it's a great idea. It's because I believe that Jesus has served me and given his life for me. And so it is my highest privilege and honor uh, Paul, one of the great writers of the New Testament, said, it's my reasonable service to offer my life daily as service to you, Jesus, and to humanity. And I dream of people who really internalize that, believe that, and start living their life um, in all fields of life. Doing acts of service um, is, uh, is an awesome thing to think about and, and, and dream about.
Now, do you think that that really is uh, possible? We're, we're inundated with, you know, especially in this town, you got to make more money, you got to be more successful, you got to be showy, you got to be materialistic, and you're saying serve, serve, and a lot of young people are like, yeah, that's good, okay, cool, you're a pastor, I'm going to go, <laughs> and I'm going to be the next Mark Zuckerberg, and I got this app, and I got to get that suit, and I got to go to that fashion show, and I got to be seen, I got to be out there, I got to be moving it, and you're saying serve. Do you think people will listen? I, I think one of the greatest audiences to listen are people who have tasted a teeny bit of that, of that life and that success and people who have, I, I've, I've done it all, I've got it all, I've arrived. And there's still an, an emptiness in serving yourself that Jesus talks about. And I think those are some of the greatest people who can say, I think there's more and I think it's, it is serving yeah, I, I, think the, I think the paradoxical teachings of Jesus are resonating with a new group of people because of the disenfranchisement of, of, of the American dream. Frankly, I think the American dream is falling flat. I think people are realizing it, and they're going, what's next? And then here comes along the ancient teachings of Jesus that says if you lose your life, you'll find it. Jesus says, what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his soul in the process? I mean, that's compelling material in the, in the epicenter of culture, creation, materialism here in Hollywood. And so I think the, the words of Jesus are so powerful in themselves. I think they captivate a wandering heart, a searching heart. And I truly believe I wake up every day compelled believing that people are searching and they're desperate and they want absolutes. I believe that the, the human makeup was designed for faith, hope, and love. And I believe the human experience falls completely flat and empty without faith, hope, and love. I believe people are desperate and searching. So, and I guess maybe that's how my parents taught me, taught me to believe <laughs> that people want to hear what I have to say. And uh, so I'm pretty passionate about it. Well, I've you watched it. People do seem to want to hear what you have to say. You also write in the book... Um, I was underlining it today, but you write about faith, and you describe faith, and people struggle with the concept of faith, right? So I, I'd love for you to define faith as you define it in I Will Follow Jesus, and uh, for people who are struggling with that concept because it's hard to put your hand on it, uh, how do you encourage them to trust in faith? And you also write about trust, and your description of both is a little similar. So I would like to know also what the definition is, how they are different, and why you need both. In some ways, I'd say faith is believing for things that are still in the future or yet to come, and trust is having a peace in circumstances that are currently happening that you don't understand. I know for us in our, our journey, our relationship with God, Judah's dad passed away five years ago, and that wasn't a time for faith. That was a time for trust. That was a time for us as, as a son and a daughter-in-law, but also children of God to say, you know what, God, you love me so much and this hurts so bad, mm -hmm. but I trust in you and the peace that that brings to the human soul when we actually function in that trust for our current circumstances that we don't understand. And I think faith is that element of things that are in the future or that are ha going to happen or that are happening in the world that we don't understand. And both have to have an admission of, I don't understand. I don't know this. Of letting go. You have to be acknowledge your powerlessness mm -hmm. and have faith that you're on, as you wrote in here, or God wrote, or Jesus wrote, <laughs> and somebody wrote in here. Um, <laughs> maybe everybody's the same. Where's Mary? Where's Mary? <laughs> That's like a great question. Women Her in fault. Here. Gosh, I will follow Mary. <laughs> <laughs> no. That's part two. Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, got to get that on the move now. Uh, but, um, you know, about the, the idea of letting go and trusting in God that things will work out, having faith that you're on the path even though you don't understand it. I completely agree. I, th I, think, I think control is one of the biggest delusions in the human experience. I think this idea that we're in control is absolutely comical and hilarious. And I think faith is fundamental to our entire experience, whether we acknowledge it or not, I guess is the point. It, it is real. 
Um, and it's been said before that everybody listening here or the chairs that I'm sitting in, I, I didn't even think about it. I never even crossed my mind to think that possibly the chair maker didn't do a good job. And when I sat down, I would fall on my back and maybe hurt myself. <laughs> it's possible, but it's I didn't possible. even think about it because, again, I just, I trust. I trust the constructs of this chair. And so, so faith is actually this active thing that's a part of our life every day, whether we're aware of it or not. Yeah. So this call that preachers make or pastors make or priests make for faith is not this radical, outlandish request to believe and trust. And I think people who are like, how, how could I believe in God? It's like, well, you believe in a, a lot of things, you know? Like, this is, it, it's just kind of in our makeup to do that. And how I do think, you answer that? question what's that how can I believe in God you know I've just these terrible things have happened I don't have a job my parents are dead you know I don't have any money why should I believe in God nothing's going my way yeah well I tell him to talk to my wife I think she has <laughs> a lot of great answers and then we talk about the Super Bowl but I think um you know like like a diversion's a powerful thing I've learned um <laughs> Yeah, right I, up there with denial, right? <laughs> yeah. Boy, it's been hot, huh? <laughs> um, but I do, I, well, I, I do think I, I typically will will talk to people. For, first of all, I think this idea that 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 you, you, believing in God is um, is something that you concoct and it's something that you conjure up. It's something that over a succession of emotional discussions or, 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 or sermons, you develop this habit to just kind of like, okay, now it's it's happened. Um, I think. I believe that there is a God space in every human soul. I believe we were designed inherently to be worshipers. And I think you see it revealed in culture. We end up worshiping great athletes or entertainers. So I actually think it's not far-fetched when they say, well, how do I possibly do it? It's way, way more possible than you think. I believe that it's there. I also believe that if there is a God and he's big and he's real, then he'll actually meet you in a genuine and authentic way. That it won't just be this blind faith that's, as it's said. But I think that God is real. And I, I've talked to friends that still don't believe as I believe. And I say, hey, no big deal. But if you want to believe, let's just pray. And I believe that God will meet you in a real way. And I believe that there's a space inside of you for God. Um, I, the awesome thing is you don't have to defend God because he's God. And you don't have to talk people into God because he's God. And... Um, and I don't want to get, get into that habit anyways of like convincing people to worship God and believe in God because if you can convince them, then they can be unconvinced just as easily. Um, people, uh, I went to all-girl Catholic school my whole life and uh, wanted to become a nun and then found out you have to be poor and celibate and then it's like, well, I, I, that's not going to work for me. Uh, but uh, I was like, I don't think so. <laughs> okay, I don't think so. So I diverted <laughs> off of that path. But I, I think, you know, in, in Catholic school, we often, and we have read, and I used to read all the autobiographies of all the saints, right? And they were being, like, thrown up against the cross, and their lives were like, oh, my God. They were just horrendous. Right, but I thought you had to do that to actually be a saint. And uh, but when you read, whether it's about Mother Teresa or others that I've read about, they often talk about the dark night of the soul. You know that they, their own spiritual crisis and having to kind of work through that and find your way back to God. Has that happened to you? Or are you too young? <laughs> way too young, <laughs> definitely. No, no doubt in God, no spiritual crisis, no having to find your way back, no uh, giving up on Jesus and having to find him at any place. Um, harming my children. Is that, no, I'm kidding. Um, uh, believing that I could pull off this parenting thing, I've definitely had some challenges of trying to raise kids. Can I do this? And that's been a lot of questions. I think uh, some of the darkest nights we've ever had was with my dad. And to be incredibly candid, because he was one of the good guys. Mm -hmm. He was faithful to my mom. He was generous. He was kind. He was uh, incredibly considerate. Um, and he pastored a church of thousands of people. And he did it every day with all of his heart. And uh, if there was everyone, if there was anyone that ever deserved not to get cancer, I think I would put my dad at the top of the list. And so I think when you see your hero not only um, you know, d deteriorate physically, but, but emotionally and mentally as the cancer was, was eating his body alive. Um, he, absolutely, there's those dark nights like this. this there's, there's so many guys that, that aren't doing anything good, and yet my dad, the good guy, like 
the best dad, the most amazing, great golf partner too. And really other than my wife, my best friend. And it's like, okay, this doesn't make any sense. And you know what's amazing is that I found the same kind of articulation in the middle of the Bible. I found King David, ancient King David, who, who seemed to yell at God. He had these dark days, dark nights, dark afternoons. I mean, he was just constantly in this emotional upheaval. And I found great um, refuge in that as David just cried out to God. And what I love about God is that if he's God, when you question him, he's not insecure. He's not like, oh, you're questioning me? No, please believe in me. I think he likes the dialogue. And so I found that in my darkest nights, which is what you're alluding to, boy, I found God to be more real than I could have ever imagined. How? How? Um, his presence, his nearness. And I think the reason we did this, mm -hmm. I didn't write the Bible, God did, but <laughs> is because it's this book. It's this book that met me in the darkest nights with my dad. Like I said, I found the songs of David, the Psalms. And I saw that David felt like I did at one point. And to think that God put that in his book gave me this perspective that I serve a real God, an authentic God that wants to hear me cry and wail and yell and admit that I'm annoyed at him. And this doesn't make any sense. And so the reason I think we're passionate about this project is it's, it's this book that provides this platform or environment where I truly encountered God. What spells success for you with this book? Hmm. Or do you, and, and do you think that way? I feel like success can so often be defined by numbers and it can be defined by one. You know, realistically, if we hear from one child 15 years from now who says, I was reading that storybook or my parents were reading it to me and I realized that God loves me, that will be success. But if that can happen, thousands and thousands of times over, even better. I also, when I was looking through the book and I thought it was interesting because I've read and grew up with a lot of books about Jesus and he was always really white. <laughs> he was really white and kind of sometimes blonde and stuff like that. And uh, you, you uh, made him very different looking. You made him more authentically looking. He's dark. I can't, I'm trying to find a picture of him in here. On the cover. Yeah, he's right no, there. okay, but I mean in here. One, yeah. He's in here. He's definitely non-Swedish. Yeah. There's no Irish Catholic in him. Yeah. So I, I was, was that a, like a deliberate, uh, did you do that to be authentic? Did you kind of talk that through? Was that important? It was important to me as a dad, to be honest, and we showed the pictures to our kids, and my 11-year-old uh, acknowledged that Jesus is, 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 is brown. And I said, that's right. And that um, is a very meaningful moment to me. I mean, it, I could get really emotional because I think um, Jesus is, is for everyone. But I think where Jesus came from and, and uh, I think the diversity of this, this book. But, um, yeah, I, w I, I wanted my babies to see who Jesus really was. And I know it's just a cartoon character, but the color of his skin mattered to me. It really did. And the fact that my 11-year-old acknowledged that, and the fact that I had an African-American friend text me in tears, in tears, he said, I'm ordering him right now. I said, don't order him, I'll send him to you. He goes, he goes because this is the first Bible I've ever seen Jesus depicted with brown skin. And he says, I want to thank you. And I cried, I mean, I secretly cried. I was like, oh my God, what do, you know, what, we were responsible to revealing the real Jesus. And um, so, yeah, it's obviously I can get super emotional about it because it, even, even the diversity in the book matters a lot to me as a dad. Not as a pastor? Second, yes, as a pastor, <laughs> which I'm supposed to say. But I just I want my babies, you know, to, to understand the, um, the beauty and value of each and every, the, 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 the diverse, beautiful, different ethnicities in the world. Are so it's, it's just important to me that my kids see that, and, and clearly to our whole community. But when, when, it, when, it, when my 11-year-old acknowledged it, it was one of those moments where I was like, okay, maybe I'm doing okay at this dad thing, like that he <laughs> saw this and that it mattered and it registered, because I think that matters to God. How important is your shared uh, relationship with Jesus and God? How fundamental is that to the success of your relationship? With each other? Yeah. Whew. Well, it's difficult, you know, what we're doing here, <laughs> but uh, um, I'm kidding. You, you know, love me. Anybody who's been in the room, who's been married for more than 10 minutes, knows that marriage is hard. And I think yeah. one of the uh, 
the heart, the toughest things about marriage is realizing I've committed my life to somebody who is going to let me down. And what will I do when this man lets me down? And not in any great ways, but he's not perfect. And the reason that spirituality is so important is that one of the foundations of Christianity is forgiveness, that we believe in Jesus who forgave me of all the wrong I've ever done, and that he does not hold a single mistake I have made against me. The Bible says as far as the east is from the west, that's how far God has removed our mistakes from us. And so when I have a relationship with that kind of God who has forgiven me in that way, I don't really have a choice but to forgive him for the times he's let me down. And with that forgiveness comes a foundation of a relationship that can last, we're 16 years, hopefully a lot more, but... And it will be a lot more. Oh, that's it's good to hear you publicly say that. <laughs> <laughs> Trying. I will call on that later. <laughs> you know what's a really cool thing about, about God in the middle of your marriage is that you can talk to him together. And listening to your spouse talk to a being that is transcendent beyond this, who is over and above and between and is the glue. Is, is incredibly humbling, compelling, and endearing. And so today, we were praying um, in, in sitting here with you that we would do a good job, um, and we were just getting ready at the sink, and she's like, okay, you start praying, then I'll pray. And to just hear your wife say, you know, God, we trust you, and I'm not great with big groups, but help me, and, you know, we love you, and it's like, oh, my word, I love this woman, and I love that together we get to talk to God and grow closer together. And... Um, you know, that's just a practical illustration of how God just makes how it all. Awesome. How that work? So do you pray together, and when you say it's such a cool thing to listen to your wife pray to God, let me in on that. Explain that to me. Well, um, it's... Uh, it, I'm so much more spiritual, so... <laughs> I wasn't going to say that. Um, yeah, because prayer is often such a personal yeah. thing. It's a quiet thing mm -hmm. very often. And I was raised to kind of believe that oftentimes that uh, you can only talk to God in silence, that God can only come through in silence. And yet the idea of praying aloud with another, even though we do that in church and stuff like that, but to do it in your home, in your marriage, uh, to me is super cool. And uh, I just don't know how it works. Well, Jesus said, you know, when you pray, say. And so I think there's something about, it, not all prayer needs to be verbalized, but there's something about verbally, um, you know, just articulating your prayers. It didn't necessarily have to be in front of people, but I think there's something intimate and beautiful with the person you love the most on this earth, and you're vulnerable. Um, I think it's sexy, if I could just say, if I could use such a crude term to describe, because it's, what is intimacy? Intimacy is not just sex, it's vulnerability. It's going, okay, you get to see inside of me. And prayer is... It really is this primal cry to God. It's not this ornate, beautiful quotation of this amazing story. It really is this primal cry going, Dad, Heavenly Father, oh my God, I'm so nervous, I'm scared, or help me. And to hear her articulate that, sometimes it's easier for her to talk to God while I'm listening, and then later I go, hey, babe, when we were praying, like I heard you say, how you doing? She's like, okay, yeah, I'm not doing that great, I guess. You know, I could really, so it's a, uh, it's a bonding moment. Yeah. It's, it's, very, it's very intimate to me, and I love it because I like being intimate with her. That came out wrong. <laughs> but anyways, I meant spiritually. Now, we, we talk uh, <laughs> uh, here when we do these conversations, we talk a lot about community. Mm -hmm. And I remember coming to hear uh, the two of you talk one time, and you talked about community and surrounding yourself with people who uh, had your values kept you strong, kept you on the right track as a couple. Uh, talk a little bit for uh, couples who are here and also who are watching this online about the importance of a community that holds you with God. Yeah, I think first and foremost, community is family. I have to acknowledge my mom and dad are here, who I'm so grateful for. The Applause. Yeah. <laughs> Applause. <laughs> Starting community with that, but you know, I we weren't made to live life alone. You know, we the storybook starts with the story of creation where God created man and woman, and everything in the world and the environment was perfect. But God said, mm, It's not good for man to be alone, even though there was no wrong in, in the world, because we were made to do life with, with each other, with people to laugh, to cry, to 
celebrate and life is empty by by ourselves and community genuine friendships some of our best friends in the world are also here um it gives everything we do purpose and meaning yeah and solomon was quoted as saying that a man who isolates himself seeks his own desires and rages against all wise counsel i mean that is an outlandish statement about isolation and lack of community i think there is something to be said about about isolation and what it does to the human psyche i think we were we're community creatures i genuinely believe that here's the breakdown when it comes to community whether it's a community centered around god or whatever the community centered around is it's just inherently messy isn't it it's just messy it's just easier to be like you know what i'm going i'm going to move to montana wear burlap and live in a tree house and just eliminate the drama of what people the drama of i hey, I, I spent time with you, now you should spend time with me. Because that's how our brains think, isn't it? It's like, I did a favor for you, I helped you move. Why can't you help me move? And then all of a sudden, here comes the breakdown of community. But as long as we enter community knowing that we're all fractured, we're all fragmented, and there's going to be moments we're going to let each other down in marriage and family. Um, if you put all those cards on the table and kind of go, okay, look, it's going to happen, it's messy, but are we committed regardless of the feelings of disappointment and disregard and lack of respect, or you miss me, you didn't say hi to me. Um, I'm, willing, I'm willing to dive into the mess, because I think the benefit far outweighs the challenges and the difficulties. As a minister and, and in being in ministry, what is the thing that you find in 2016 that people most need, that people are most yearning for? What is going on out there in the world that you're noticing in your ministry? I think so many people want to be known. We live in a world with so much technology and people can know what you ate for breakfast this morning because you posted a picture, but do they really know what's happening in your soul on the inside of who you are? And I feel like there's just a craving in humanity yeah. to be known. Who really knows me and what's happening on the inside? And as Christians, obviously, we believe first that starts with our creator, that he knows us. Even the things about ourselves that we don't know, he knows. And that's such an incredible thing to think, God knows me. But then if we serve a God who knows me, we can have relationships with people who know us as well and be vulnerable to be known. It's, it's, you can't, can't say it any better. I mean, that's why I married her. But uh, I think that we, we live in, we're, here we are in the middle of Hollywood, and, and this is the epicenter of I, I want to be known. And I think people are surprised. I think we're, we're very concerned. And I know, I'm sure you've experienced this, is social media ruining life? Um, is Instagram and Snapchat and followers and uh, you know, approvals, likes, all that? But, but actually, I think it's just revealing what has always been there, which is this inherent desire to say, I, I, do people know me? Do I count? And when I'm gone, will they know that I was gone? And uh, so it all, it all boils down to what? Relationship. And we were designed by God, I believe, for relationship. Relationship first and foremost with him. I mean, the idea of family and the construct of family and terms like dad and fathers, these terms and ideas were authored by God in his narrative because he designed us this way. And I think people are desperate for authentic relationship. And I believe it's our responsibility by the grace of God to be architects of community, which I believe is architects of change, that we foster environments and spaces where people who maybe have been hurt and now have isolated themselves can begin to re-engage in a lifestyle that I think should be surrendered and surrounded. It kind of sums it up for me. Have you, have you uh, found that there are people in your ministry that you just cannot reach? Um, probably. So here's the problem when you ask that question, because I was raised by a mom and dad who told me almost every day that uh, people like you, they want to hear what you have to say. <laughs> oh, you're one of those guys. I know, right? <laughs> one of those annoying, right. like... Yeah, one of those, like... So uh, I just believe that we can just help, you know, by the grace of God, we could help anybody, but um, I, I'm sure there are people that, 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 that are difficult. And what do you do when you say that we can help anybody, and when you write this book, what are you hoping... When you say to help people, what are you wanting them to see? What are you wanting them to discover about themselves? What do you want them to realize? I think the, f the number one realization is that God loves me. 
and yeah. that that's the foundation for all the other help that we need in the rest of our lives. So all of this, your preaching, your ministry, this book, it's really the central message. You want people of all ages to have a relationship with God, to know that they're okay, that they're good enough, that they were made uh, in his image or her image, uh, her image, <laughs> <laughs> and, but that they, are, that they are good. Yeah, you're, 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 preaching, you're preaching my sermon. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, whosoever would simply believe, trust, accept, receive, will not perish but have everlasting life. The layers, the complexities, the, the trappings of Christianity have gotten so ornate and complex. We have lost the simplicity of the message. And it is that there is a creator God who loves us in our fragmented state. And what, what does it take? Just, it's just like taking a gift. And receiving a gift can be hard. I get it. But it's literally just, okay, God, I trust you that you love me and that I'm going to spend eternity with you and that now matters and that you're not going to leave me nor forsake me. I do not know how I could lay my head on my pillow at night without that reality, how I would have made it through the journey with my hero and my dad passing away to know that there's a God who loves me and, and his love is unconditional and relentless and it's always for me and towards me and he is that dad that is ever present. He's always there. When you cry out dad, he's the dad like, what is it son? I'm here. I love you. Whether we feel that all the time, Martin Luther said feelings come and feelings go and feelings are deceiving. My warrant is the word of God and none else is worth believing. And so I, I, I believe um, that, that people need to hear of the love of God and it really is our passion, starting with even children. Do you ever, um, you know, because ministering, right, is a full-time job. You know, there's always people in need. One of my favorite quotes is, be kind because everybody you meet is engaged in a hard battle. Wow. And, um, and that really, that there are people who want to be heard, want to be seen, want someone to talk to. They're lonely. They're isolated. Does it ever feel like too much? Absolutely. <laughs> I don't know what you're going to say. If you're going to say no, I was going to be like, yeah, no, never. We're, uh, we're so good. We don't fight either. Yes, and in those moments, I think the only thing that we hang our hat on is that we are not anybody's savior. No human being can be any other human being's savior because we are all in this together. And how do we lay our head on our pillow and sleep at night? It's like, oh, God really does all the heavy lifting. He's the savior. So I was a I was a I was a youth pastor for ten years for my mom and dad, and I had this moment where the youth ministry was growing, and I was like having that David moment. Where I was like, Oh God, I'm so busy, so much going on. I have no idea. I have no you know no idea. Looking back, it's hilarious, but I felt so busy, and I remember I just felt this impression. It said, I sound so spiritual, but God said, Remember, you're a sower, not a savior. Meaning, your job is just to sow the seed of God's story and His word to the earth. It, it, if God is God. He's God enough to save people, and I'm certainly not. So it, it is that way of just kind of going, hey, I cast all my cares upon you because you care, and um, I'll do what I can by the grace of God, and then I'll go home, have a good meal with my wife, and tuck my kids in at night. Is there one story in here that is your favorite, that every time you read it, you're like, <clears throat> that's my favorite. That speaks to me in a way that no other story speaks to me. Do you want me to go or do you want to go? Oh, go? How cool would it be if we had the same story? It'd be amazing. You know, like a teller, you know? <laughs> <laughs> what is this? A, is this a married talk show? But um, I, uh, David and Goliath, right? Because for me, it's my dad. It's, it's, that was my favorite story. My dad used to act it out because, you know, he pastored for 30 years. So he would act out and he would do like Goliath's voice and then he would do David's voice and he would do the slingshot and all that. And so David and Goliath reminds me so much of my dad. And, and I, I, David and Goliath became this picture of this is Jesus is your David and life's going to have Goliaths, but he's always going to be there and it's going to see some t seem sometimes like you're overwhelmed. And so David and Goliath for me is one of those stories that um, at a drop of a hat, I love it. Let's talk about it. I'll reenact it like my dad did. And when I first started preaching as a 16 year old guy, I went to Alaska and did seven nights of revival. Um, I think I told David and Goliath every night. I didn't have much more material. So. And it worked. <laughs> well, debatable. Good. Is it so bad to say my favorite story is actually probably the very first one, which is the story of creation? Mm -hmm. And what I love about it so much in 
in the storybook is that each story has an introduction and a conclusion. And in the introduction to the yes. creation story, it is a story, actually Judah, his cousins all made fun of him and for how big his head was because he has a very large head and large lips and a nice jawline. Well, no, I got voted. We went with all of our cousins. Who has the biggest nose? Who has the biggest lips? Who has the biggest head? It was all me. And I was like, well, it's proportion. You know, like. <laughs> so handsome. But talking about, so the introduction is kind of a version of that story. And then is, is there something wrong with me? Was I made with something wrong? And then going into the story of creation and how God yeah. created human beings. And, and I just think that sense of identity and purpose is so important that I love the first one. <laughs>